The Mishkan was a temporary place for Hashem. So what eternal lessons could we learn from the Mishkan? And while we're about it, let's explore the mystery of why the parasha that speaks about constructing the first home for Hashem on earth is called Truma, which doesn't speak specifically about building a home for Hashem, but rather about collecting. It could be collecting for a variety of reasons. And let's explore the difference between when Hashem does the work versus when we do the work, which really is the point. We have explained multiple times with regards to names that are designated for the parishes. Even though the simplest explanation would be you choose a name from right at the beginning of the parasha. But because there is a specific custom which names we give to the parish, we know that a minag is more than just a custom, it's fundamental to the whole of Judaism. And it's part of Torah. Can in Torah everything is absolutely precise. We must know that the name of a parasha expresses the primary theme of what that parasha is about. And we can really appreciate this when you look at the teaching the Baal Shem Tov, the Alter Rebbe brings in Shari Yichud Vayimuna, about the whole world, that the name designated in the holy tongue for any particular thing, is the life force of that particular thing, and obviously then represents the theme and content of what that is all about. If that's true of a stone or an animal, how much more so it must be true of a parasha. So Vinyan Zeh, this concept, Shashem, a parasha in Herakli Simone Be'alma, that the name of a parasha is not just simply to distinguish one from the other. Mochuchugam, Mishem, parashas Truma, we'll see specifically in our parasha, which is called Truma. Because, Im Noima, Shashem, a parasha, Hurak, Al Shem, Aschola, if you want to say Truma, is called Truma, because the word Truma is right at the beginning of the parasha. And of course, we need to be able to clearly distinguish between one parish and the next. That's why we can't just simply take the first word of the parasha. Or the first words of, you know how many parishes would be called something like Vayidaber? There are many parishes where the first words are the same. Which is both by Noach and by Yitzchak. Or where Hashem speaks, which is common to many, many parishes. So that would be the logic to choose a word that is close to the beginning of the parish but is unique. And that would distinguish between one parish and the other. But that's not the only reason we choose the name. Because if we were to use just the first unique word in the first sentence of the parasha, then our parasha should not have been called Truma. We should have chosen the word which is because that's a word that's earlier in the Pasuk and therefore closer to the beginning of the parasha. And that would be the unique word called as parasha. But we don't. We specifically call it Truma because Truma represents what the parasha is all about. And we move on. The reason this parasha is called Truma is it's not just simply as a tag, as a distinguisher between one parasha and the next. Because Truma represents the real message and content of this parasha. The overarching theme of this parasha that distinguishes it from all the other 52 parashas of the year. So now, if that's the intention, that Truma is supposed to stand out and tell us the very unique message of this parasha, Truma doesn't seem like a great choice. We need to understand. A little later in the Sikha, we'll come back and ask the question that Truma actually doesn't seem the appropriate word to represent the entire theme of this parasha. But before we get there, let's just look at the word itself. In a Yesra Halkein. The concept of a truma, a donation, is not unique to this parasha. Because there are various donations discussed in the Torah. And to the extent that Chazal tells us that there are actually ten different kinds of classical donations in Torah. And our parasha is only talking about one of those. And what is that? 
the donation that was used in order to facilitate the construction of the Mishkan. And even if you look at the explanation of Chazal that it says Vichli Truma and then it says Vazoi Satruma, etc., it says it three times, there's actually three different designations. Still, there are only one type of Truma, different designations of contribution to the Mishkan. And especially when you consider that generically when we use the word truma, we're talking about a tithe given to the koyen, not a donation to the mishkan. How then can we suggest that truma represents the very unique message only of this parasha? When in truth the word truma donation, truma stam, is dealt with in many parishes in the Torah, and take, for example, the end of Pasha's Koyach, which speaks about the donations to the Koyhanim. There's a lot more detail about Truma in that Pasha than the Truma discussed in our Pasha. So how is Truma a fitting title that's supposed to capture the essence of this Pasha, make it unique, if apparently it's not so unique? That's in terms of the word. Now let's talk about the content, Va'oid. Furthermore, it's pretty obvious that the unique message of this week's parasha is the, 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 the instructions of how to make the mishka. Now, the word truma has no implication of building or making a mishka. Truma only speaks about the fundraising that was done to facilitate the building of the Mishkan. But Truma doesn't speak to the heart of the issue, which is the building of the Mishkan. So how then could you argue that the main thrust of the parasha, which is making the Mishkan, Nimtza Batevas Truma is represented by the word Truma? It's not. Truma is just a necessary precursor. The truth is, this, the question is even stronger because logically the order of the parasha is also strange. It would have made most sense. The parasha should have started with the instruction, make for me a mikdash. Which obviously is the main point of the parasha and the reason why anything else is happening in the parasha. Why are we collecting money and gold and silver, etc.? Because there's a primary need to build a Mishkan. So start with the primary need. And then one of the processes to get there would be to make the collection. That's only a means to an end. Make the collection so you can build a Mishkan. So the logic dictates that the parasha should have said, Hashem said to Moshe, make for me a mishkan. And only after you've clarified what the purpose is to build a mishkan, then then you could talk about how you're going to make this mishkan, which includes to make a collection, get all the resources you need, and then get into the details of what you do with those resources in order to build a mishkan. The fact that the Pasuk doesn't do that, but instead it first gives us the instruction to make a collection. And only after that tells us the instruction to build the Mishkan, gives us the opposite message. It sounds like the most bizarre suggestion that the word Truma somehow represents the Mishkan even more than the direct instruction to make a Mishkan and we need to understand how that is possible. Even beyond that, when you really think about it philosophically, surely the purpose of the Mishkan and the process of the contributions are opposite. What's the purpose of the Mishkan? Kishmoi, as the name implies. That the Abishta's presence should dwell with us. In other words, the goal is the goal is not the making of the Mishkan. But the result, once you've made the Mishkan, that the Divine Presence would be there. Because And as long as the Divine Presence is not yet in the Mishkan, even though every component of the Mishkan is complete, it's not really a proper Mishkan yet, right? So now, how does the Divine Presence get into the Mishkan? 
Rashos Ashkina Sheba Mishkan, the presence of Hashem in the Mishkan, Eno Yecholel Yos Nifeles, El Adi Yadir Tsoinoi, Vekoicha Yakol Yocha. The only way the Divine Presence enters the Mishkan is because the Ebishter wants it to, and because the Ebishter is able to make the paradoxical reality of infinite God in a finite space. And we know this because when Shlomo Americh made the Beis Amigdash, he said exactly that. Shlomo Americh says the heavens and the heavens beyond the heavens, meaning the highest spiritual realms, cannot contain you, Hashem. And this house, this structure will contain you. Which is an ongoing, perplexing thought. That Hashem's infinite presence. That cannot be contained in the highest possible spiritual realms. Should enter and be, so to speak, at home in this little physical structure made by humans. message highlights for us it highlights for us that the only way the Shechina is in the place that we've designed for it is because Hashem wants it there and puts it there and it is not something we as humans can make we can't do it we can't create it we can't cause Hashem's presence to come into this world so Mishkan represents the Abish manifesting in the world on his terms now the name of the parasha, which is Truma, implies Asher Adra, but the exact opposite. That's not a word that emphasizes Hashem's investment of His presence into our space on His terms. Truma emphasizes the human endeavor. We're collecting gold and silver and other things in order to build a physical Mishkan. The word truma doesn't even imply that Hashem has, so to speak, accepted our donation and now chosen to manifest His godliness in it. The word truma only speaks to our donations, to our contribution. So if the purpose of the Mishkan is that the Abish just should choose to put His Shechina amongst us, how is the name to represent that truma which speaks about that we're going to make a collection? <laughs> the limited human resource that has nothing to do with the infinite divine input. So to understand all of this, we're going to go to the question which is, why do we have to know the details of the Mishkan? Let's look at a broader question which is, Why does the Torah give us so much intricate detail about the donations to the Mishkan, Asias Karsha Mishkan, Ayurias Vichule, and then all the details of how big the the block, the, the wood panels were, and how big the the, the covers were. But the Shalis Chazal may have a have like the Gemara asks, you know, what what was was. It doesn't have a relevance in our days. There's never going to be a Mishkan again. Halabat Atzman Emesh Mishkan Hu Arai. The Torah tells us right up front that the Mishkan is temporary. As the Pasuk says, when referring to the Mishkan, says, I'm going to traverse, I'm going to manifest myself in a tent. A tent is a temporary environment. And the instruction for the Mishkan is clearly temporary. As the Pasuk says, because you haven't yet reached your final destination of complete rest. So this is a temporary Mishkan. What's the long-term permanent mitzvah? To have a permanent house for Hashem in Yerushalayim. So if that's the case, how is the detail of the Mishkan, the instruction of the Mishkan, relevant to us generations later? In all times and all places, even at a time in history where the Mishkan has been hidden, nobody knows where, and the Beis HaMikdash replaced it. So why do we have to know so much detail? Say they made a Mishkan and that's it. Okay, we can understand why we need the details about the two Bate Mikdash. Because yes, they have been destroyed. 
But we need the information from the first and second base amigdash to be aware of what to anticipate and prepare for the third base amigdash. Because pretty much the design and layout and construction of the third base amigdash will be modeled after that of the first two bot amigdash. So that we know, we've got to have that information. But why do we have to know all the detail of the Mishkan? What materials were used? How it was collected? How they built it? Beyond that. If you want to learn about the Beis HaMikdash, it makes absolute sense because we don't only learn the details of the Beis HaMikdash and read up on the Beis HaMikdash to be ready for a third Beis HaMikdash when Moshiach comes. As the Rambam says that when it's time to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash, we'll know what we're doing. Beyond that, when we learn the details of what the structure of the Beis HaMikdash looked like, in a Gedivra HaKadosh Baruch the Ebesh just says, I consider it as if you're physically building the Beis HaMikdash. Right now you cannot physically build the Beis HaMikdash. So when you learn about it, it's considered as if you built the Beis HaMikdash. Or Kabir Chazal, Shalidei Poelim, Shaloi Yeh Binyan Beisi Botel, as the Gemara tells us, that by learning about the Beis HaMikdash, there is never a time in history where the construction of the Beis HaMikdash is left unattended because we're attending to it in the best way we can, which is to learn about it. So when is all of that relevant? It's relevant if you're learning about the Beis HaMikdash because that's a preparation for Moshiach and that is considered like you're building the Beis HaMikdash. Because the mitzvah to have a Beis HaMikdash applies to every single generation. It's not that we don't have a mitzvah to build the Beis HaMikdash right now, we just don't have access. But the Mishkan was only relevant to that generation in the, in the desert. Why do we have to learn about it? So we'll suggest a possible answer that it's part of the process of understanding how the Beis Amigdash developed and we'll see that that's not sufficient and we'll have to look for a, deep, a deeper answer. Maybe the easiest answer would have been something the Rebbe explained elsewhere extensively. That instruction, which is make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell within you, even though the Pasuk is in our parasha and it is with regards to the Mishkan. Truth is, it's actually the root of the mitzvah throughout the generations to build a base Amikdash. So in other words, it's a kol habata mikdash. That that is the mitzvah that extends to all the bata mikdash kol habikdash teliyasid, including the one at the time of Mashiach. Hanishat siva al kol bata mikdash is nilmad minat siva al binyan amishkan. In other words, the instruction to build a base hamikdash is actually derived from the instruction to build a mishkan. And later on in the sicha, we'll see why that has to be. Now zois vaoi. Let's go further. We all know, of course, that the layout and design of the Beis HaMikdash and certainly its dimensions were very different to the Mishkan. Nevertheless, we know, though, that the layout and design of the, of the Beis HaMikdash is effectively a reflection of the Mishkan. Same concept of an outdoor area, an indoor area, the division of the Holy and the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the various components, etc. And besides the fact that the design of the Mishkan is going to be reflected in the Beis Hamikdash, the idea of the collection that happened in order to build the Mishkan is from where we learn in the language of the Rambam. That every adult Jewish male and female has to contribute to the Beis Hamikdash both in their uh, in their talents and abilities and in their resources. Lufizem move on. That will help us to understand. Aha, so learning about the Mishkan is is relevant to the Beis Hamikdash because we extrapolate a lot of what we know about the Beis Hamikdash from the Mishkan. And it helps us that you know, it's a when we rebuild the Beis Hamikdash, we'll know how to do it properly. Not only that. We could actually explore this in a far deeper way. The fact that the Ebishter mapped out the course of the chronology of the Beis HaMikdash to be. First you have a Mishkan which is temporary. To facilitate a place for divine presence until they get to Eretz Yisrael. 
And then they wish to design that the next part of the chronology is to build a base Amigdash eventually in Yerushalayim. Because that's actually how you fulfill the mitzvah. The mitzvah of Asil Mikdash is first a temporary, easy to make Mishkan, and then you graduate to a permanent, more difficult, expensive thing to make a base Amigdash. Bitchila Mishkan, first make a Mishkan oil, Arai, which is temporary. And not something which is a long term uh, inheritance. And only once you've had the opportunity to have your short term Mishkan, then you're empowered to be able to have a base Amigdash in the long term. And that would help us to understand why it is that part of learning about the design of the, of the base Amikdash includes the Mishkan. Because in order to complete the concept of that the Ebishter will consider it as if we are constructing the base Amikdash because we're learning about it. It won't be sufficient only to learn about the Beis HaMikdash itself. We actually have to learn about the Mishkan. We even have to learn about the parts of the Mishkan that are not going to be replicated in the Beis HaMikdash because that is how the process happens. First there's a Mishkan and only through the Mishkan do you get a Beis HaMikdash. So that's how you've got to learn it. Sorry, only once you have completed learning about the Mishkan, then you'll have the opportunity to learn about the Beis Hamikdash as Inyan Animal Aliyim Kilaim Oiskim Binyan Abayis that the Ebrister will consider as if we built the Beis Hamikdash. So it would appear that maybe that's the explanation. Why do we need all the details about the Mishkan? Because they are in fact relevant to the development of what would eventually become the Beis Hamikdash. But it's not enough. Because we have to remember, Torah is eternal. Because there was a period of Jewish history recorded in the Torah where the Mishkan was the only entity that stood as a representation of godliness in the world. And we fulfilled the requirement to make a, a Mikdash Vashem through this Mishkan. So we're going to have to say that there's something about the Mishkan that has eternal value, not only as a stepping stone to the later development of the Beis HaMikdash. There's got to be a Mishkan spiritual sta status. In other words, there's got to be a lesson from the Mishkan as the Mishkan, not as the part of the build-up to the base Amikdash. The Mishkan in and of itself has to have a permanent lesson and insight for us, and we've got to discover what it is. So Babir Bozed's explanation is when Egal is man ashros ashkin elamata matzinu b'midrashim beis deyos. The two opinions in the midrash, two different midrashim actually. At which point did Hashem's presence enter the Jewish space? B'mokim echod matzinu b'divrei Chazal. One midrash, which we all know really well, says Shadovani falb matan Torah that Shchina came into the world at the time of the giving of the Torah. Shaz, as we famously says, botok zeri shena that the initial decree that barred. Uh, contact between the high and lower realms was dismantled. And then the lower worlds were able to elevate to the higher worlds, the higher worlds were able to descend into the lower worlds. And the Ebishter says, I'll start the process. The Ebishter says, I, and Hashem came down at Har Sinai, and only after that, then Moshe was told to go up. So that's the first time that Shechina in the world, the Ebishter comes down onto Har Sinai. That's the first manifestation of Shechina in our world. One Medrash, Medrash we're all familiar with. There's a different Medrash that says, When did Shechina actually enter the earth? Only when the Mishkan was established. Now, you can't have this, is what we call a Maklokos and it's, it's It's not an argument. It either happened one way or the other. Unless we're trying to convey two different experiences of what it means that the Shechina entered this world. So the two Midrashim are effectively describing two different elements or perspectives of what it means to have Shechina in this world. There is no debate between the two Midrashim. What does it mean when it says that the Shechina entered the world at the time Hashem gave the Torah? That's the Abishta's initiative. Hashem decided, I'm starting a process, I'm coming down into the world. Which means, that means that the manifestation of Shechina was purely Hashem's initiative and purely driven from on high. 
So yes, when the Ebishter did manifest his Shekhinah temporarily on the mountain, as I call him, he couldn't touch the mountain on pain of death. The physical mountain radiated holiness. But at the end of it, when the shofar was going to blow, that would be a sign that the shechina had left. The Torah says clearly, everybody could go onto the mountain, no problem. That means that Har Sinai would revert back to its original mundane, unholy status. So yes, there is shechina, but it's shechina inputted by Hashem and retracted when Hashem, so to speak, leaves the space. But in a completely different sense, when we build a Mishkan which facilitates divine presence, that's made through human endeavor, through actions the Jews took. Look at, look at the Pasuk says it a number of times when it's describing either the Mishkan or the Kenim. It says, Va'osu, they made it. Mishkan Tase, you should make the Mishkan in this way. V'chule, many, many reiterations of the idea that we have to make the Mishkan. Therefore, because the manifestation of Hashem's presence through our construction of the Mishkan is facilitated by people, Jewish people, that actually transforms the physical items of the Mishkan to become holy. The Mishkan is now a holy item at all times. Or to say the same thing in Hasidus language, similar to the language of the Medrash. The experience of Shechina at the time of the giving of the Torah is completely top-down. says, I'm initiating. And of course, the objective of bringing godliness into the world, which is what happened at Har Sinai, is that the world should be elevated as a result, because the goal is always that the world should become a place that accommodates godliness. And in the Abishta's world, unlike ours, potential doesn't have a delay before it translates into reality. So if the Abishta has this potential energy to transform the world, the world must be transformed. And therefore, so what happens is that the lower physical world becomes a place that accommodates godliness right then at the time of Matan Torah. We see it play out in practice. That the sounds of the Ten of the Aseris Adibros came from all directions, including above and below. What does that mean? It means the world itself was testifying that there's only one God and that Hashem is everything. In other words, the godliness had seeped into the world itself. In the most perfect way, except Avol. That's not the purpose of creation. The purpose of creation was not that the Abishter should make himself a home in this world. The purpose is The goal and objective is not that the world should become a holy place because Hashem's potential must manifest in reality and because Hashem wants a world that is a place accommodating godliness, it must automatically happen. Because then we have no participation. We haven't made anything into a home for Hashem. So what's the real intention? It doesn't want to do the work. He wants us to do the work of making this world a place that accommodates godliness. That we as humans should transform the physical world to become a Mishkan for Hashem. And that is the massive innovation of building a Mishkan over the tremendous revelation at Sinai. That Hashem revealed Himself at Har Sinai is amazing, but not surprising. That we could make a place through our avodah and turn that place into Hashem's home—that's a big achievement. 
That will help us to understand why this pasuk, why this parish has started off first speaking about our contribution. Because that highlights that the turning of a place into Hashem's embassy is made through our efforts. That is something that will be specifically expressed through the concept of truma, of donation, as we shall explain, because truma really could mean two different things. And when we put them together, we get a clear picture of the great contribution and the great innovation of making a mishka. So, bitruma shnei pirushin, the two possible uh, colo- uh, typical translations for the word truma. Aleph pirush rashi, afrosha. Rashi explains truma means you separate something. So, you, you have a certain amount of gold, you separate a portion, you tithe it. Beis, the Zoyar says, haroma. Truma is from the word to elevate. Or beis pirushim elak shurim ze boze. Now, these two are related to each other. It's not only telling us a practical thing that we are the ones who tithe elements and therefore elevate them to become godly. So it was gold and now it's godly. And yes, we're going to come to the Shalafan of the Voalia. There's actually a lot more to this. The different I- insights into the word truma tell us how we go about achieving what we need to achieve, which is to transform our world into Hashem's home. Tevas truma afrosha. Let's go with the first explanation, Rashi's explanation, which is that truma means tithing or separation. That's madgisha. That that emphasizes something really pragmatic and and almost relieving for us, which is shein adam leisun kol mashatachas yodai. Truma means you're not giving everything to Hashem. Elohim mafresh means you're separating, you're tithing chelik min achosav a percentage of your assets. And then that part that you separate, you then elevate. You designate that for Hashem. As the Pasuk says, Take it for me, Lishmi, that it becomes something which is called on Hashem's name or represents Hashem. Now this concept of taking segments of our lives and elevating them to God, that also illustrates the two different possibilities of how the Shekhinah enters the world. Let's assume that the way the Shekhinah entered the world was on Hashem's terms, Hashem initiates the process as He did at Matan Torah. Well then, then the entire world will have the identical experience of divine manifestation all at once because there's nothing to block Hashem that, you know, to have to grade His revelation. He reveals Himself and it's right across the world equally. But on the other hand, if the way we're manifesting godliness into the world is through our human efforts, then there's the difference. As the Torah says, people give based on their personal generosity, how they feel. And that doesn't just only mean that different people give different amounts, but it means in one person's process, you develop over time, you, you, you grow your ability and capacity to give. We're dealing here with lowly entities in a lowly world that is not naturally submissive to Hashem. Now the person working on his spiritual development, takes a piece out of the world because he knows to fast and merubalo to fast. And if you're going to try to do everything at once, you'll get nowhere. So he takes a piece, chelek mino oilam, a piece of his life. Omerimo, he might be Allah Kaddish Baruch, he elevates it to godliness. Once he's done that, then oilahum idargeladargo, then he progresses to the next level, the next challenge. Omafrish omerim chelek noisaf. Then he takes another segment of his life, which is kosher for kavod yoser, a more challenging area of life to elevate min ha'olam, and he takes that part of the world. Slowly, slowly, over the course of time, piece by piece, segment by segment, action by action, he eventually transforms his whole world to be connected to Hashem. But it doesn't happen like this. The Ebrister arrives on Arsina, the whole world changes in a flash. We build a mishkan. Everybody at their pace, their contribution. Some person can give gold, other person can only give copper. And you get there over time. And this is not just a distinction between the two orders in which the world could be elevated. But there's a fundamental difference in the result. So it's not just that Debisha can do everything at once and we have to do it in increments. But the way the world is transformed is completely different if Hashem is doing it or if we're doing it. Because if the transformation of the world is directed and controlled by Hashem, 
The net result is the world will dissolve in the face of Hashem's great revelation. Because when you reveal godliness, anything that isn't godly disappears. Like they, the Chazal tell us about the giving of the Torah, there's such a manifestation of godliness. The birds couldn't chirp, the, uh, the, the oxen couldn't, couldn't make their noises. But when the transformation of the world to become a place that accommodates godliness is something done from the bottom up through human endeavor, and especially when you're early on in the process of this transformation, represented by early on in the building of the Mishkan, then we We haven't transformed or dissolved anything. We've just allocated certain resources to the when we allocate resources to serve Hashem, we don't make them disappear and no longer have any sense of self. Because no person is capable of completely undoing themselves, their own existence or the existence of the things in their lives. To put it really simply, At the time of the giving of the Torah, where the radiates this massive amount of divine energy into the world, the world crumples. Basias a mishkan. When you build, there's a key word. You build a mishkan. Is that kosatachtun? Then that refines and elevates the world to become something it, it wasn't by nature, but it was always potentially designed to fulfill. Bezoatam. That's the reason. Shakasam menes kol yud gimel or tezvav prate advarim shibetur me limlech samishkan. That's why the Torah goes into all the detail of the different types of materials. One opinion says thirteen, another says fifteen types of materials that were used to contribute to the mishkan. Because the message is in our mission, which is to transform the world to become a place that accommodates absolute godliness. Every piece of the world has its own methodology and its own journey to become part of that grand tapestry. Every part of the world is its own type of truma. How you allocate the resources and how you elevate the resources is different. It's not a one-size-fits-all. That will also explain why the Pasuk first tells us about the necessity to make the contributions. And then let's see if the Mikdash tells us actually what the objective is, which is to make a home for Hashem and Mikdash. That's also why the name of the parasha is not Mikdash or Mishkan, but rather Truma, because because the main message of our parasha is not that there will be a Mishkan to accommodate God, but rather the message of the parasha is that we will be the ones to make it happen. The parasha is not focused on the result, it's focused on our contribution to that result. And that works, the way we work is step by step, we start, so to speak, low hanging fruit and then we develop beyond that. First we start by allocating resources and then eventually we have this transformative experience. And that's how we fulfill what the real intention was for creation in its fullest sense, not by having Hashem step in and blow us away with His revelation, but by us actually working through it. That's what Truma is all about. Truma represents bringing godliness into the world through human step-by-step endeavor. Obviously, we had to first have the introduction of Hashem doing the initiative so that that would like empower us to be able to do it. But the goal is that the manifestation of godliness in the world has to be the result of our efforts. And actually, that's the only way we can bring the deepest dimension of Hashem Shechina into this world, even more than Hashem would do by revealing Himself at Har Sinai. That explains why the name of the parasha is Truma. Because there may well be 10 different kinds of donations that Chazal identify, but actually they all draw from They are all defined by and guided by the Truma mentioned in our parasha. That 
overarching direction of taking the world and turning it into a place to accommodate Hashem, which is to bring godliness into the world through human effort. And then all the other trumas that follow, they're all details. So that will help us to understand why the details of how you build the Mishkan and all the materials that go into the Mishkan in and of itself, not only as a build-up and a stepping stone to the Beis Hamikdash that would follow, the Mishkan itself is an eternal message for all times, even though the physical Mishkan was for a limited time, because as we've mentioned, Torah is eternal. The fact that at this point in time, Truma is introduced, representing human input to transform the world, it's not only because, okay, Matan Torah is over. The Eivish's input has ceased. The, the shofar has blown and therefore, you know, Hashem's shechina has departed the mountain. And therefore we, don't, we no longer feel Hashem in the world, so it's kind of up to us. So that's not the message of the Mishkan because there's a lack of divine input. Now we've got to step up to the plate. There's actually something much more profound going on over here because the Mishkan, unlike the Beis HaMikdash, is in an inhospitable environment. And it got me Pnei Shehoi Yosef Midbar. It's because the Mishkan was in the Midbar. Midbar Baruch Nius Tumokim Umatzev Asher Lo Yehishav Odom Ha'elion Shalakis Seisham. The definition of a Midbar is a place that is not designed for human habitat. And the word for human here is Adam, which is also, a, 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 it also implies Hashem Himself, who is called the Supernal Adam. What does it mean it's not a place of human habitat? Hainu. The concept of Hashem being present, so to speak, resting in a place, which means being revealed in a place. The Shechina being manifest is not natural to the environment of a desert. Whereas an urban environment, a place that is filled with people, that's a place for divine, that's what you expect, that's a place for divine revelation. Out in a desert, you know, what is the Abish got to do in a desert? And that's the big difference between the Mishkan and the Beis Hamikdash, which was in a city in Yerushalayim, the capital city of the Jewish people. You could only build a Beis Hamikdash after the Jewish people came to the place of long-term uh, accommodation and a place that was their eternal inheritance. They had to get out of the desert and come into a place of human settlement. And where did they build the Mishkan? Not just in any country on earth which is inhabited, but specifically Eretz Yisrael, Nemar, which is described as a place which has constant divine oversight. And in Israel, out of all the cities in Israel, specifically Yerushalayim, as the Medrash says, a place of the ultimate level of awe of Hashem. Within Yerushalayim itself, as Yaakov says when he wakes up from his famous dream, the gateway to heaven. The Beis HaMikdash is put in the most brilliant spot on earth. So therefore, the effect of making the Beis HaMikdash into this home for Hashem, is not altogether because of human endeavor, actually. It's a place that the Ebeshter chose. It's a place that Hashem chose to designate as holy. It's a place that Hashem has designed to be apt for divine revelation. So the Beis Hamikdash is in the most likely place for a Beis Hamikdash. But when the Jews are in the desert, the desert, that's not a place for divine revelation. It has nothing about it which designates it to be a, designates it to be a place of godliness. To the, to the countries, it's a place that belongs to other nations. It's a place of toxic creatures, dangerous, venomous creatures. And a place that uh, the thirst that people have is not for water, implying there's a lack of resources, implying that there's a misguided yearning for the wrong things. It's the least likely place you'd expect to have a, a, a home for Hashem. So therefore to make a Mishkan in such a place, to turn that forsaken place into a godly place, 
He mitzad avodah sodom mitchila v'atzoy. If that is complete in the hands of humans, Hashem hadn't made this place designated for kedusha. Boy, from shatruma canal, it's our work, our truma. That's why we have to know the story of the Mishkan throughout the generations, because it's the story of the Mishkan that empowers us. That even when we're in a time of God, where we don't see signs of godliness. We're in the so-called desert of nations of our times. We're not living in a place of natural divine revelation and miracles. The darkness is extremely dark. And the message of the Mishkan is don't lose hope. Dafka in a desert, that's where you make a Mishkan. That will also explain why the Pasuk Vasin in Mikdash, which is actually talking about the Mishkan, is also the source for the fact that you build a base on Mikdash. The big difference between having a home for Hashem in the form of a Beis Amikdash, whether it be the Mishkan or the Beis Amikdash, as opposed to a revelation of Hashem and Har Sinai at the time of the giving of the Torah, is as we've mentioned, it's because it's human success. And we see the greatness of human endeavor and achievement specifically in the Mishkan. Because as we've just learned, it is in the Mishkan that you're in the desert, it's the least likely place for divine revelation, and yet you can build a Mishkan. That is, illustrates just what the Beis Hamikdash is about. The Beis Hamikdash is a place of transformation of even the darkest. With that in mind, we can take a deeper look at Diuk Lushayna Harambam. The expression the Rambam uses, everybody is required to, to contribute to building the base Amigdash, or Le Sa'id Be'atzmon, and to personally assist in the process of building the Mishkan, over Mamonim and with the assets, Anoshim Be'noshim, men and women, Ke Mikdash Ha Midbar, like the Mikdash as it was in the desert. It's interesting. In this halacha, suddenly, the Rambam refers to the Mishkan specifically as the Mishkan of the desert. One halacha before, Shafbon is Kara Mishkan, where he does also speak about the Mishkan. Lord, no katalosha Mikdash Amidbar. There he doesn't mention the fact that it's the Mishkan that was in the desert. Why? Because this is what he wants us to know. Inyan Zesha Bibinyan Beis Amigdash, this aspect of building a Beis Amigdash, which means leave no sort of side, but atzmam uva mamoinam, personal investment of energy and assets. Avoid us ha'adam ba'if and shal truma. The input of humans represented by the word truma, designated resources and elevating the world. Yesoido yuhu, it is originally from, v'hu bedugmas and has to emulate mikdash ha'midbar, how they made a mikdash out of a midbar. Ha'shelo yeshev adam shom, a place that is devoid of godliness. Mokim she'ein le'shaych as the gilei le'kos, a place that is not designed for divine revelation. So that the message would be clear, the purpose and goal of a Mishkan and subsequently a Beis HaMikdash is that we make it happen where it is not natural to exist. And that is a direct message for each of us. Occasionally a person might feel that person might feel I'm, I'm in a desolate spiritual space. I don't feel godliness. Anything to do with godliness, anything to do with spirituality, it's just not, it's not sitting with me. A person could think I'm lost in the desert and they could become despondent. So therefore we have this eternal lesson that there is the concept of the Mishkan in the desert. In fact, the primary uh, 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 instruction to make a base Mikdash started and was first applied in that Mishkan when all the Jewish people were in a desert. So a person shouldn't give up hope and think I'm lost because the original Mishkan was made in a time where everybody felt that they were spiritually bereft. The fact that a Jewish person when in a state of spiritual emptiness 
can then push through and make a mishkan. That gives us the advantage of light that emerges out of darkness. Until eventually that elevates a person from the most unhealthy desert to the most spiritually developed desert, where the desert is a metaphor to Pichinas Kiloyodamhu, a place that connects to Hashem as Hashem is beyond the level of Adam. Yes, Adam is a name that we use to refer to Hashem, but the highest level of Hashem is Loy Adam, beyond even that which is called the supernal Adam, which we could access by taking our piece of the world where we feel so spiritually adrift and turn it into something of commitment to Hashem and manifestation of godliness. That is the ultimate. It elevates us beyond anything we could have imagined. And if it's Hashem, it transforms our whole world to become a place to accommodate godliness in the, with, which will happen with the coming of Mashiach.